Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of the AUD podcast channel. I'm your host Khaled Abdeljabain. We are honored to have Miss Christine Oclair as our guest on the show today. Christine is the lead of advocacy and campaigns at UN Habitat, the United Nations Agency for Human Settlements and Sustainable Urbanization. With over 25 years of experience, her mission is to promote urban sustainability, the implementation of the new urban agenda, and the urban dimension of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development through innovative and impactful campaigns, initiatives, and projects. In this episode, you'll learn how urban planning can affect the future, the challenge of meeting housing demands for people, the need for unity in order to tackle global issues, and the importance of finding a balance. Please join me in welcoming to the show, Miss Christine Auclair. Thank you. Thank you so much for your time and for coming on the show. We really appreciate it. So, um, Christine, you are the um, you've been in working with the UN for now for over twenty five years. I know you have a PhD in uh, urban planning and a lot of your work and now you're currently the coordinator of the world urban campaign uh i know i know you've been in, involved with it before and now you you're you seem to be the leading coordinator about of it as well um so for today's conversation christine um we, i really wanted to dive in into the work you do uh your experience what what urban planning is what the future of that looks like how can it you know support us in everything we're trying to achieve by you know 2030 with the sustainable development goals and so on but before we get into all of these things, Christine, why don't you give all of us a little bit of background about yourself and we'll take it from there. Yes, so, um, well, I got a PhD in urban planning in 1993 uh, from uh, Paris um, French Institute of Urban Planning, Okay. urbanism. Uh, that was a new institute in those days. Uh, urban planning is uh, relatively new. Yeah, exactly. In yeah, fact, yeah. yes. And uh, yes, so I, I went, I came to the UN uh, in 1994 uh, to work on indicators, urban indicators. And well, I have also uh, prior experience um, in the field, on the ground, in Paris, as an urban planner and architect. Okay, so you've been you've been doing this for quite a while right now. So I want to start, Christine, uh, first of all, with just under if you could tell all of us, because I think a lot of people might not be aware of what urban planning is. Tell us what is urban planning and why is it so important um, in terms of building sustainable cities and the future? So I would like to start by saying urban planning is not a science, is not an art. And I'd like to define it as a multidisciplinary field. A multi make, okay. Yeah, to make cities and towns. So it brings together design, management, policies. It starts by thinking about the streets, uh, the patterns of the streets that make the city support infrastructures and building and make people enjoy the space and find it beautiful. Uh, I'd like to use an anecdote. Uh, I think it's really important. I, I remember a colleague who was a statistician, and one day she realized a big percentage of slums in cities in some part of the world, and, and once she told me, we need to tell government to do slum prevention. And my answer to her was simply, this is called urban planning. <laughs> okay, okay. So you see, you plan before slum happen, mm -hmm. yeah? yeah. Uh, and my first conviction that urban planning was essential is when I started to work in India as an architect. Okay. Uh, to study the shape, the design of traditional houses in small town. And then I went to Chennai. Uh, that was in those days four million people. What, that was a very big city. Uh, and I really discovered the large slums where people live uh, in really poverty, not enough water, not enough sanitation. Well, I'm a French citizen and discovering slums, there are small uh, poor areas in France, but the magnitude of, of the slum, then I realized that the real issue was how to prevent such thing to happen mm. and by doing planning. And well, the issue is far beyond planning. It's also an economic problem. It's a poverty issue. But urban planners are the, at the heart of these difficult, complex issues. And we need to be multidisciplinary and work with everyone. Yeah. Uh, so I can imagine your experience in India was a big, you know, uh, as you put it, a very eye-opening experience, um, being exposed to, you know, the 
the magnitude of the slums. I remember when uh, my my wife and I, we went to Brazil uh, earlier in the year for our honeymoon and just seeing the favelas there, it uh, kind of it was also a big shock. You can have such a advanced, you know, city. You can have a beautiful, you know, building and right next to it, there's hundreds, if not thousands of little, you know, favelas and people living in those kinds of conditions. So urban planning, you said, is a multi is not an art, not a science, and it's multidisciplinary. And you need, you know, policies, you need government, and you need it to be planned correctly. So my question is, let's say, let's say I built a city and I didn't take urban planning into consideration. And now here I am 20 years later and I have, you know, all these issues, for example, with these slums and stuff. So the question then becomes, how can I fix that issue? Because it's not a simple thing. It's very, and like you said, uh, the economics of it is a very big and important thing as well. So if that's where I am now and the city is already built in a certain way, I find it would be quite challenging to rebuild it in a different way. What, are your, what, would, what would your thoughts be? Well, uh, there is n not one fix uh, to that problem. I think uh, what you can do is slum upgrading. Slum upgrading. Upgrading. So what, that's what we develop at UN Habitat. So uh, basically to upgrade, um, to provide more water, sanitation, uh, services. But we can't fix slums. Okay. So what we need to okay. make sure is that they don't grow and we do better planning before they happen. Yeah. To uh, yeah to expand here, and for the planner, it's it's in fact we need to to see that the the planners have a huge responsibility. The moment they draw a line and decide that this will be the main artery of a city because that street will last forever, and people will blame planner and they will hate <laughs> the sure, city. I'm sure. <laughs> they have planned for them if it's impractical or if it's ugly. So what is expected for planner is to create, create beautiful places mm. to plan for before uh, problems like slum uh, comes into the picture and people need to feel happy yeah, in that city course. and yeah. thrive. Yeah. Uh, so planners are expected to produce places where people can live better, interact, have a social life. So they need to, pre to do good public space uh, that is healthy and uh, they need to provide green space, walking space, because they will thrive if this uh, is happening and they will be able to work smoothly and get better livelihoods. Yeah. So it sounds like from where it's very interesting what you said that you, we can't fix what has happened, but what we can do is try to improve the current state of the situation as, as much as possible. Um, so when you say uh, upgrading the slums, providing them with you know, sanitation, providing them with adequate housing, because what I learned doing my research is that this is uh, kind of like what you're saying is not a quick fix issue. It's not a simple fix either. And there's so many aspects that go into urban planning or the health of a city besides you know how a street is designed you know the economic factors the social factors and you want to provide people with a platform to give them the opportunity to get out of those living conditions does that sound about right yes and and now we have the climate imperative we need to create resilient cities because we are going to face climate change uh, robust enough to face climate change, facing new episode of strong weather, heat waves in the best possible way. So that's yeah. an additional layer of, of challenge, I would say. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And when you say, so what does, when you talk about building resilient cities, what, if you could define, what is a resilient city? Well, uh, as I said, a resilient city is robust enough to face climate change and to prepare people and to uh, adapt to the, to the different challenges, but also how to uh, face the strong episode of uh, the, the big episode of strong weather and have good infrastructure, yeah, solid infrastructure, resilient for the long term. Yeah, so something that is uh, like a strong foundation that is adaptable to the ever growing, you know, climate challenges and climate needs that, you know, we're going to be facing over the next couple of years. 
Um, coming on to, I wanted to come on to, you know, your experience. We're going to come back, circle back to climate change in a little bit, but I wanted to come on to your experience with the, uh, the World Urban Campaign. So uh, I just learned about this very recently um, and about the uh, World Urban Thinkers as well. You know, it's, <clears throat> correct me if I'm wrong, if I've understood correctly, the campaign serves to provide a platform for everyone to kind of come together and to share ideas and discuss and try to figure out what are the best what is the best way to move forward? So I'd love to hear from you. Tell us, you've been in it, doing it for over 10 years. You know, tell us about your experience with that. Yeah, so the, the World Urban Campaign was born in uh, 2009 and we launched it in Rio de Janeiro in 2010 at the World Urban Forum. This is a, an event that UN Habitat organized every two years, a massive event to talk about cities. Uh, in those days, what was needed uh, because um, the word urban was not really on the map in the UN system, urban. Okay. And most essentially in the Millennium Development Goals. So we are talking about improving the life of slum dwellers in the million, Millennium Development Goals. Uh, so we had to lobby for a better recognition of the urban uh, in the international community. Uh, because we had a sectorial approach. We were treated, treating topics separately, not looking at the intersection between those fields in cities. Mm. So we need, how do we bring transport, water, energy, people? Uh, we need to bring the demographers, the expert in housing, gender, to talk about cities together. So that was really a, a realization that many people were also grappling with that idea that urban needs to be better recognized in could, the international community. Yeah, could you tell us, uh, could you just explain to us that word urban? What, does, what, is, what would your definition of urban mean? Because I think for people who don't, like myself, who don't know, does that mean uh, cities? Does that mean you know, countryside? Like what, what does the term urban mean uh, from your definition? Yes, there is no universal definition <laughs> of urban, unfortunately. Uh, but everything that is about cities and towns. Okay. And uh, so what we did, we launched that campaign uh, in Rio with local governments, so cities. Cities, uh, okay. City uh, leaders, decision makers, civil society, researcher, grassroots organization, academic, youth, gender, professional, urban planners, architects, uh, to come together yeah. and, and to lobby for an urban SDG. An urban you know, SDG, because okay. In the Millennium Development Goal, there was nothing about urban. Oh, really? Yeah. Interesting. So okay. in the SDGs, we have SDG 11, that is cities and communities. So we have lobbied for that. Of course, we were not the only one, but uh, that was a good um, platform for that. And now we continue to lobby on key topics. So we have a, a manifesto called The City We Need. Okay, uh, I like that. that. We, I like that name. The City We Need. And that evolved in The City We Need Now. No, okay. Because okay. we can't wait. Yeah. Uh, and now uh, that we prepared for the Habitat Tree Conference 2016. And uh, we have 10 principles in The City We Need. Okay. That we have changed. Yeah? Okay. After COVID, we put health and well-being number one. Yeah, yeah. So I'm sure. I'm sure. I'm and sure. Uh, it has everything about good planning, infrastructure, services, dignity, uh, inclusion, heritage, architecture, sense of place. So we are a very big family. Yeah, uh, cl clearly, yeah, for sure. The, the World Bank sure. campaign. Yeah. And we are at the same table bringing the business, mm. sometimes the youth, decision makers, women. And we organize, as you said, uh, not World Urban Thinkers Campus, but Urban Thinkers Campus. Sorry, Urban Thinkers Campus. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so those campus are to share ideas, concept, uh, and also recommend action. And take action sometime, you know, uh, bringing partners together, we decide, oh, we are going to do that. Yeah. Yeah. And also showcasing what is good, what, what are the good practice at the moment in the world mm. to inspire others, to talk about them. Okay. To, yeah. This is storytelling as well. Sh yeah? Sure, of course, of course, so, absolutely. Yeah. So the work is sort of collective intelligence uh, around everything urban. Uh, I think urban is the future. We have no option. <laughs> yeah, I don't and, think so either. Uh, yeah. 
yeah, it's, it's always important to reflect on the way we do cities, we design them, we manage them, and now to address crisis, yeah. Yeah, so um, it's very interesting how uh, it sounds like, like you said, you are a big family. I like the word that you use there, collective intelligence, because you're bringing everyone to the party, the public, the private, the government, and you're trying to tackle... I, I feel it's also quite overwhelming because there's so many things that, you know, you want to address. And like you said, after COVID, the health became, you know, the number one priority, which makes, you know, that makes a lot of sense. I'm curious. So you come together to, you know, share knowledge, to implement new policies and to create that like you're trying to create change. But for example, is it do you find that, let's say I'm a city in X country and you're a city in Y, you have some goals that you think are that are very important to you and mine might be completely different so the question then becomes okay what can we learn for each other maybe how can we help each other but how do i prioritize that yeah so the goals the sdgs are universal they, universal they are universal they were conceived by member states uh, they were not conceived by uh, city uh, decision makers but by member state, by national government. Yeah? Okay. Well, with the support of all the stakeholders, that's a UN process. Yeah. But that's fundamentally a national government process. Okay, interesting. In which everybody is invited to contribute to be at the table, including the uh, private sector, um, civil society, etc. So at the city level we have we have a program at Habitat called SDG Cities. SDG Cities. So we look at what are the most crucial SDGs that needs to be addressed? But at the country level, there are expectations that governments are to report. Yeah. Uh, okay. They, they are reporting on a regular basis. And at the city level, it's not mandatory, but we are encouraging cities and we are creating, we have created tools. Uh, we are promoting the use of the SDGs and you have like a city like um, uh, Mannheim is a very good example in Germany. Okay. They have used the SDGs from the beginning and they're engaging the citizen to discuss the, SD the SDGs, adding additional indicators, mm -hmm. uh, etc. You know, what are the priority of Mannheim? Yeah. I think it's really important that uh, every city look at this because the SDGs are like uh, guidelines. Like Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, yeah, they are yeah. framework. Exactly. Are framework, yeah. uh, I didn't know actually that it was, uh, it's very interesting to me to hear that these, the SDGs, I, uh, not that necessarily they're universal, but they were decided or agreed upon on a national level. So you have the national level, then you have the governments that need to implement it in those various cities. And then you have, you know, the society as well, that uh, clearly in Mannheim that they're trying to educate and involve, and you have the private sector. So you have so many different, you know, moving pieces and so many things going on. And I can uh, bringing that all together is I can I can imagine, you know, quite challenging. But now if you're reflecting back on your time uh, with the uh, involved in the World Urban Campaign. Because you've you're I think you have a very unique experience and perspective because you've been the work you do exposes you to so much and in so many different ways in so many different places. So. Reflecting back and through your experience, you know, with the Ur World Urban Campaign, what, if I ask you, what have you learned about people and, you know, the world we live in? What would you say to that? I think what is uh, exceptional about this campaign is that at uh, an early stage, we realized that we need to be all together at the same table. Okay. We were really thinking in a sectorial uh, manner by different groups thinking together differently, uh, separately, uh, talking about different, what, what I would say, silos. In Sil terms of exactly, sectors, yes, you know? yes. So there was a silo approach, and I think the campaign broke that uh, and said, no, we need to be together. There is no way around it. And it, it, it's not rocket science when we think about, of, of it today, but in the, in the beginning of the 2000s, uh, the years 2000, it was a bit new uh, in the UN system. Yeah. Sure. So I think that that is uh, and that collaborative space is really important. And you see, uh, business have, have learned so much from uh, civil society, for example, from grassroots, from women group. 
You know, you need to listen to learn to listen to each other, mm. to create synergies and, and then to better exchange. And sometimes you are very surprised uh, by the kind of interaction that happens. So I think the UN has this convening power, mm -hmm. bringing different, uh, well, member states at the table, but now also non-member states, uh, you know, civil society, business, research, uh, yeah. professional. So I think that's what um, the World Urban Campaign is about. But the World Urban Campaign will not solve the planet's problem. You know? <laughs> yeah. It's an advocacy platform. Yeah, absolutely. It's a change platform. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's essentially advocacy yeah. Know, yeah. and lobbying. Yeah, yeah but that, I, think, um, I think you said something very important there, like to learn to listen to each other, because mm -hmm. there might be so many similarities that you're both experiencing, but also they might be doing something you mentioned, you touched on best practices that, oh, that could be the solution to you know address our issues. Um, so... The World Urban Campaign is you, you switched from a secretarial approach and a siloed uh, approach to, you know, tackling all these issues to bring everyone together. Let's sit down on the table and let's discuss all these things now. And there's a new urban agenda, which kind of, based on what you're saying, I feel it, it, it's trying to address something similar, which is, you know, developing interlink interlinkages between global agendas and establishing uh, what you touched on earlier, an inclusive and incremental uh, reporting system. So... How can we create bridges between these different, uh, all the different nations of the world and the member states and so on to be tackling not only can this solution just tackle, for example, climate change for both of us, but maybe it could also help us with our energy crisis as well. You know, how do you start building those bridges to start tackling multiple SDGs at the same time? Yes. Yeah, so. You were talking about the, um, the new urban agenda. Yes. I think it's, it's important to, to come back to that because that's a global framework adopted by the United Nations, by, by the member states, okay. to guide sustainable urban development. So we have the SDGs yes. that are universal, agreed by all member states. We work all over um, in the UN system. We use that framework. But then just after the SDGs were approved, we did the new urban agenda to say, you know, we have, anyway, that was, we have a 20 years re, um, conference cycle. So it, it was uh, 2016 and in uh, Quito, um, we were using the habitat agenda of 1996 to produce the new urban agenda okay. of uh, 2016. Okay. So that became a document uh, that talked about urban sustainability. Yeah. Um, and the World Urban Campaign is just, it's a campaign, yeah? It's not that um, document, it's, but it's a, it's a way to talk about the new urban agenda. Exactly, so yeah. That's what, it, that's what it sounds like to, yeah. me, to me, yeah, from your perspective. Uh, and make it more approachable because the new urban agenda is a big document, it's a bit difficult to digest for many people. <laughs> sure. So when you say the city we need is uh, inclusive and safe, the city we need is um, is healthy and uh, promote well-being. So these are simple things we say using the campaign, but it's to translate the new urban agenda into more concrete and engaging formula for yeah. uh, groups that are uh, not necessarily attuned to to this. Yeah. Yeah. So the new with the, so with the <clears throat> the new urban agenda, you said it was based. Um, from 1996 to 2016, it was based on those 20 years to set for the next, you know, to plan for the next 20, if I've understood correctly. Mm. And my, is there, so does that, so with the new urban agenda, do is it kind of like the, because I generally don't know, so I'm curious, is it like the, for example, the Paris Agreement that, you know, we've all here, we've all agreed to, you know, this target and we're all, we all need to work towards, you know, either the SDGs of 2030 or the 1.5, you know, cap uh, of, the, of the climate and so on. Is it this, do people involved in the urban agenda have that same responsibility or are these two completely different things or are, is there some, you know, connections there? Well, the, when we did the new urban agenda, we used, of course, the Paris Agreement. We used the SDGs. We used former agreements okay yeah yeah but the urban agenda is not a legally binding document so we are oh, not okay okay it's not 
like the Paris Agreement, where we really monitor, mm. you know, your emission level, your commitment. Uh, the SDGs are also, we have indicators. The new urban agenda doesn't have indicators. However, a lot of the SDGs talk to the new urban agenda. So uh, it's more a policy document okay. uh, with principles and governments have committed to it. But it's not as binding as I s- the others. <clears throat> I yeah. see, I yeah. see. So it, it's so interesting that they're all, you know, talking about there's the World Urban Campaign, there, which is kind of like the, let's say, the, the spokesperson to have the talks about the new urban agenda. And then the new urban agenda includes things from uh, the SDGs and the policies of the Paris Agreement, you know, to build this new urban agenda. And we've all committed, but it's not a law. So... There's so many um, in, uh, connections and there's so many different levels to this, which I find um, really, really, really interesting. Um, and I was looking at the SDG report from 2022 uh, that was talking about housing. Um, and I, did, I wasn't aware that 50% <clears throat> of the world lived in cities uh, and their projections at 70% will be uh, living in cities by 2050. Um, so, and you once said in an article that the, uh, the entire planning process, uh, from your experience for what you've seen, has been flawed. It's not taking all the different factors into account that they need to be. So, how do we need to rethink now uh, urban planning and cities to cope with this increase in urbanization and the demands for this 2050 projection? What would you say? I think we need to look at housing first. I think housing first. part of the, your question started on housing. Yes. And I think we need to go back to this data. It's really important. Sure. Yeah. So we have 2 billion people, more than 2 billion people today. We don't have access to affordable, adequate housing. And this is a big number. Yeah. And it is going to increase to 3 billion yeah, by 2030. And that is 40% of the world population. Wow. So that's, uh, that's, a, that's very significant. Yeah, and it's so it's really important. And uh, we have estimated at Habitat that we need to build 96,000 new housing, affordable homes every day. Every day. To uh, to uh, reach the estimated three billion people by 2030. Wow. So uh, and in some countries <sighs> that is an emergency. Yeah. Uh, and this has been exas- exacerbated by the COVID-19 uh, because we have deepening uh, inequalities, you know, with um, the crisis after uh, the Ukraine war has also triggered uh, in- inequalities, further inequalities. And there is a sh- rising shelter deficit. And a lot of people are going to be more vulnerable to heat waves, floods, storm so we now now have the another layer of of emergency that o- is on climate. top of what it yeah. is yeah and and really ha- housing is really the first line of defense for people we have seen that during covid uh, if you don't have a house i mean how are you going to protect yourself uh, so the same with climate you know if you have a heat wave uh, you need to protect yourself uh, oh, I know. see. That's how you're talking about it. Okay. The protection is, is really important. Okay. What's happening at the moment in many cities around the world, I don't know about Dubai, um, but there are prices that are really skyrocketing. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I think globally that's, what's, that's yeah. what's going on. Yeah. In cities. And we have never seen that level. I mean, I see that in Europe and not only for people who want to buy, but also for renting. Yeah. Uh, look at Paris, London, Mumbai. I mean, Asia has a lot of issues as well. And we have rising property values, uh, rent price as well, and people cannot afford. Sure. So what do people do? They go somewhere else. They go far. They are increasingly disconnected. And they go to dysfunctional areas and slums. And uh, so this this is likely to increase. Yeah. And then you have homeless as well. Uh, I mean, uh, exactly, it's yeah. It's shocking to see the number of homeless and uh, because there is no affordable housing, yeah, and people have less income. So in addition, you have the climate crisis. And because of the new climate imperative, uh, people we, need, we are asked people to, uh, to adopt new carbon materials, new norms, new technologies. And this is 
increasing the cost in many um, exactly contexts. absolutely yeah, yeah yeah so uh what will happen more illegal development marginalization of communities who cannot afford we cannot upgrade uh, so having this for, uh, f um, phenomenon of illegality, unsuitable settlements, slum, uh, with a high price of land is going to increase. I mean, that's what I think. But, well, there could be a new magic bullet. Uh, <laughs> that would be <laughs> But that, uh, be this great. combination of crisis, now you have the COVID-19, post-COVID-19 uh, inequalities, and now we have the wars, yeah? Um, this call for really profound questioning the way we've, we have planned, we have designed, we have built housing, but also cities, yeah? And how good are our current national housing policies, our national legislation, our housing finance yeah. to drive market? Because you need to have market for affordable housing. Of course, yeah, not for absolutely. Luxury, not for yeah, luxury yeah, yeah, housing. yeah. Hundred percent. So yes. Yeah, that's. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there's, um, that's a lot to unpack. Um, I, when you talked about, <clears throat> excuse me, that uh, housing was the first line of defense against climate change, I didn't really understand uh, when I was doing my research. I didn't understand what you meant, but now I, I, I get what you mean. Yeah, I, I need a roof over my head, you know, to protect from the heat, from the cold, from whatever. But what you said that it's going to take, we need to do 96,000 affordable homes every day in order to meet the demands of where we're going. That is a shocking number. And with everything you said, I, th I didn't realize during my research, I think we forget about COVID. It's like this thing that happened once upon a time, you know, uh, it, it, was, it was bad, but now everything is fine. But doing my research and looking at how much it affected the multiple SDGs, you know, globally looking at the 22 uh, report mm -hmm. was shocking to me. And not only from a health perspective, I didn't realize how much it also affected or amplified the climate crisis because all of these things you know they're, they're they're all linked together and when it comes to the uh the housing side you like you said it's very costly to you know to do these things uh it's not going to you know to build that many homes it's not going to happen overnight changing policies in multiple different places is going to be you know typically policy takes time you know to implement and to do, be done correctly and then to even build the homes so with the it's it, it's challenging because we know what we need to do, but the, the, the pace of where what's happening daily in the world and where we're moving and what we need to do to catch up, I feel there's such a discrepancy there. What do you think? Yes, but it's also an opportunity. So I want you to come to that. Uh, yes. You want to see the, the, posi the, the, the more positive, positive side? Yeah. <laughs> because, you know, we need to build so much. Sure. But at the same time, we have to know that the building and the construction sector accounts for 39% of energy and process-related CO2 emissions. Wow. Yeah, so, um, and first the 11% for manufacturing the building material itself, such as steel, cement, and glass, this consume 11% uh, of the CO2. Okay. This produce CO2, 11%, uh, yes. yeah. So, that can change, yeah. So if we have to build every day 96,000 housing units to address the demand, and we do it right, we can decarbonize, yeah? Okay, decarbonize. We can decarbonize if we do it with the right material, if we find a better material, affordable, we can decarbonize. And in addition, if we put housing in the right locations, because what is killing us these days and is increasing our footprint is the way we built. We built far uh, from amenities, from school. When you have to spend 50 kilometers per day to go to school uh, back and forth, 25 going to school, 25 going back home. If you have to go to work and another 20 kilometers back and forth, your footprint is huge. Yeah. The infrastructure you need to put, the road you need to put, the metro, the train, all this is going to cost uh, us in terms of increase our footprint. So if we do it right, if we have a better proximity 
and we talk about these days of the 15-minute city. 15-minute city. Can yeah, you tell us a little bit more about that? The 15-minute city is basically an approach to say everything has to be 15 minutes from my home, walking distance. Walking distance. Yes. Oh, wow. Okay. That, yeah. that, that's a very ambitious goal. Walking or, well, a mix, but sure. 15 minutes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, if possible, walking. People need to walk more uh, because also for health issues and well-being. So if we put those 96,000 units every day in the right location so people don't have to commute, use uh, energy, transport, etc., we are going to also save phenomenal emissions. Yeah. 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 Uh, so I think doing the right, uh, having the right approach in the design, material, location, planning, because location is about planning. There you go. We yeah, are going exactly. back to planning. Yeah. yeah. So it can be a very effective strategy for reducing carbon emission. Mm. But we need to find the cheap, affordable materials, and we need to really think better in terms of the way we design, using air conditioning, uh, you know. Uh, I think even the design of the house, the way you have uh, ventilation, for mm. example, uh, or using uh, walls to warm the house, etc. So there are a lot of concepts that were, in fact, when I studied architecture in the 80s, we are talking about that. Okay. So these things exist, but we need to industrialize those uh, materials, those processes, mm. and um, and then change the mindset of you know the real estate, the designers. I, I know they are they are going to that. They are going to that. They are already there mm. in some countries, but not everywhere. So there is a lot of education. Yeah. Yeah. So. Um, First of all, when you were talking about the uh, that the the location is one of the you know the biggest struggles and so on, and I was just thinking, I'm like, okay, and I like the concept of the the 15 minutes. See, I would love if everything was 15 minutes away. Like you know, I live in Dubai. It's not uh, Dubai is not very big, but if you add you know the the, the, the traffic these days, yeah, it's not, nothing's about 15 minutes away. Um, and there's more places that are. Because I was thinking, I'm like, okay, the 15-minute city. Because I lived in Amsterdam as well for three years. So I've had that experience. I get, I've had a taste of, you know, the 15-minute city of a place that's easy to walk around. It's not big, great transport systems, great infrastructure. Um, uh, even here, they built the metro and so on. So they're doing all the right things, you know, to amplify it, the way people can move around and so on. So everyone's trying to do the right thing. Um, talking about the housing crisis, you know, to build those 96,000 homes a day. And you said... If done correctly, we can we can decarbonize using the correct materials. You know, rethinking. You know, it's you kind of have to rethink. It's crazy. You have to rethink everything. You know, when you're talking about the homes and the walls, I'm like, oh, I didn't think of that. And like the airflow and how much electricity might that consume? And one and two and three. So we have it's 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 almost counterintuitive. We have to build more, which will contribute more to you know CO2 emissions which was going to affect the climate side. But if we don't do this and we don't do it the right way, that might get even worse because people are not going to have, you know, homes to, you know, defend against the climate change, to be redesigned properly. When it comes to the planning side and building these sustainable and 15 minute cities in a place like I'm thinking, like I'm thinking of like super condensed places like New York or, you know, London or, you know, Tokyo and all these kind of places, these super dense cities, I find that I, I don't, for me personally, just from the outside, and again, I know nothing, <laughs> nothing about this, you're the expert, so you would know better. And when you were talking about the location aspect, how, how do you make a place that's so densely populated be able to move in a better way or to um, have access to all these things? Yeah, I think we need to contextualize. There is no one model city in the world. Right? Sure, yes. So you're looking, you're looking at New York. I think New York was basically designed in the 18th century. I mean, the, the, the size of the streets of today are those which were designed properly. I think, I think Manhattan works very well. Really, it works very well. Oh, okay, interesting. Yeah, uh, you can you can do a lot at uh, well, 
maybe uh, I've not <laughs> lived there enough. Uh, Barcelona, Paris, are those sort of not very recent cities that have been designed properly? I mean, look at Paris, the, the huge av avenues. Mm. The sewage system was conceived under Napoleon and is still the same uh, size. Oh, wow, really? Today. Oh, yes. no way. Okay, interesting. So, I, that's, I had no idea. So you need to design, and that's why planning is really important. And we, we live in a consumer society, so we think of the immediate. We, we produce, we plan sometimes short term. Yes. We need to plan big. We need to plan big. I think Dubai has planned big uh, in a way, but still the distance between places uh, is not workable. So mm. you still yes. need to... I like Copenhagen, for example, uh, because it's um, it's uh, you can use every mode of transport. You can do walking, cycling, uh, yeah, without cycling, yeah, that without was accident. Yeah. Well, too much accident. <laughs> uh, easy mobility. Sure. You can use uh, uh, you can use public transport, uh, metro, tram, uh, bus, good bus. So you can do a mix of all this. And I think it's important to offer the different options, yeah. Um, but we need to really think of which works better. But in a hot country like Dubai, uh, there are other constraints. So I, I see greening mm -hmm. is really important. Yes. Uh, in many countries around the world, even if you look at New York, it's, they are greening. They are putting more parks, more green. But in the middle of Manhattan, you have this fantastic... The, the, uh, the, park. the park, yeah, yeah. true, true, yeah, very so true. So this park has been designed at the same time mm. that we designed Park Avenue, Madison, etc., Fifth Avenue. So I think Manhattan is 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 a good design. Well, I think it has evolved, and but look at what I like is uh, what was designed in the 18th century, like in Paris, remains. So. We need to we need to plan properly. As I said before, the moment you put a line as an urban planner on the map, you need to know that this line will last forever. Yeah, you are not going to change the the trajectory yeah. of the Champs Elysees like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah? Or, very true. You know. Yeah. So I think it's really a big responsibility, and and the size because if your streets are too narrow from the beginning, the moment you are going to build and densify. You will not be able to put enough cars exactly to bring to those build to bring people to the building. So I think all this needs to be thought through. But if it's too big, it's also overwhelming for the people. So you need two wide avenues, and I find in Dubai some avenues are really uh, overwhelming. You think like you have a motorway in the middle of the city. How are you going to cross that? Mm -hmm. So. Um, well, you need a balance. Yeah, it, it is. Yeah. A it is a balance, and yeah. it's very interesting to hear. There's some. Uh, all this is brand new to me, so uh, I'm, I always like learning about these things. Um, that you know, things that happened, or uh, the urban planners of, for example, the 18th century in places like you said in Paris and in so many cities are still relevant today and work. Obviously, you made a good point that there needs to be an evolution. You know, time goes on, populations change, the way society thinks change. Um, and you talked about the importance of the education and changing the mindset. And one key thing that you mentioned is one of our biggest struggles is we, we think short term and we plan for the short term and we don't think big enough for the long term because that's like short term might be in the next five, 10 years, but long term you're looking at the next, you know, 30, 50, uh, 50 years and so on. And I think it's very hard for people to, as people, it's very hard for us to wrap our hands, uh, wrap our hands around a future that's that far away from us that we think that we might not be, you know, a part of. But I wanted to um, round off our, uh, our conversation with a couple of uh, last questions, Christine. Um, and by the way, thank you so much for educating me and educating all of us about all of this. I think um, I, the general population probably don't know a lot about these things. Um, I wanted to, first of all, ask you, you know, I like what you said that this is, although there's a lot of challenges, it is an opportunity. And, you know, the SDGs are a guideline, you know, for us, for targets for us to reach. Do you think, given the way we're moving right now, we're in 2023, here we are, guys, December 2023, 2030 is not far away, it's around the corner. Do you think we'll be able to achieve the targets globally that we're trying to? No, 
we are not uh, we are not going to achieve the SDGs, and we know that uh, unless something exceptional comes up. Uh, we have only seven years to go. We had multiple crises. We talk about the triple C crisis, yeah, COVID, um, COVID, COVID climate, mm. and uh, the war, yeah, yeah. So inequalities as well. So in certain areas, we have gone backward. Really, the SDGs. We are going backward before the SDGs were set. Wow, in we've taken that parts, much of a step back. Uh, in some con countries, mm. yeah. Um, so, uh, I'm not very optimistic about reaching the SDGs. So, we need to also reshape the SDGs. What are the SDGs after 2030s? What are we going to talk about? I think we will probably reshape them a little bit. Uh, but currently, we have too many, uh, too many challenges. Yeah, we had the COVID, which came abruptly, and that has really made yeah, a loss. Yeah, a massive, massive impact, uh, yeah. Yes. Uh, but now we have the wars, yeah. and this is a creature of our time, which we thought had disappeared. Uh, well, there were always wars, but I think they are big wars yeah. at the moment. And this is ampering our efforts, yeah. you know, when you, <clears throat> when you build, uh, and then when you destroy yeah. housing, yeah, yeah. Uh, in many parts of the world, mm. this is not e in ex uh, acceptable. And then sure. we have increasing inequalities. Absolutely. Uh, so we need to learn to share. Mm. We need to learn to share the planetary resources. And this is what's happening today at COP. We are talking about that. And I think uh, to compensate some countries, uh, because they are not those who have uh, emitted most CO2 emission is is right is fair and I mm. think um, it's uh, it's good to see what uh, the results are. Um, on the other hand, I trust young people. I think they can see uh, what has to be done, mm. um, and um, I trust they can see into the future. Um, and I see that they they. Many of the young people uh, look at collaboration, look at uh, doing something different, you know. On the other hand, we need to bring the wisdom. Sure. Yeah, yeah young absolutely. Young people, they, they need to learn from the old ones. Yeah, of course, and, of uh, course. We need to look at our current um, generations, but the ancestors as well. What because we are not going to innovate completely. We need to look at, to keep the, the good things. Sure, yeah? yes, exactly, yeah. So bringing innovation in a very sensible way and wisely, this is important. Yeah, and <coughs> uh, I think what you said is very important as well, that I think if we can <laughs> round off one word of our con all whole conversation today, Christine, would be the word balance. Um, and I think that applies in everything that we've talked about, trying to find that balance. I have, um, the way I think about balance is it's this magical place that, you know, you never, um, you never reach. Because once you find, let's say, um, you know, I'm feeling imbalanced in like between my life and uh, my, uh, my work and, you know, my free time. Great. Okay, I fixed that balance. But once I've countered this balance, once I find balance in here, I know I've said that word a lot, but still. Now I'm in balance, you know, in other places. So it's this magical place in my mind, you know, that doesn't exist. But bringing, like you said, things that need to be put in touch is thinking globally, thinking long term, bringing the, uh, the like looking for the young generation to innovate in, in, in parallel with the wisdom of the people who have done it before and looking at history and what it can teach us, keeping all the good. We want all the good things and, you know, building on the bad and so Christine, you've been doing this work for a very long time. And I wanted to ask you, at the end of your career, when you look back, when you're like, you know what, I'm, I'm done, time for me to, you know, I'm gonna retire and I wanna look back at my career. What is the impact you would like to have had? Um, I don't know yet. First, I've not finished my career. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, yes, I think 
to I, I like the word balance okay to bring balance in every thing we do I think we have learned a lot from the COVID pandemic yeah to bring balance in our life but I think we need to bring balance in our environment in the use of our planetary resources and um, well as an individual I, I see I'm part of a I'm part of a system, yeah. Okay. I'm a civil servant. I'm I'm um, working for the UN as an employee of the UN, so I'm very corporate. So <laughs> I've done my little bit <laughs> when I could, <laughs> sure. but as part of a system, yeah, yeah, yeah. But trying to bring balance also uh, in everything, I, I find sometimes we are unwise. Mm. Uh, bringing wisdom is really important these days yeah. and not to jump too much too, too quickly into innovation yeah. uh, thinking very wisely about what will be the impact yeah. in 100 years 200 years yeah. looking at the very long term yeah. Yeah, it's really important it is uh, yeah. you're 100% 100, you're 100 correct and uh, correct on that and I agree with you uh, I think I like what you said you know to find balance in and in a summary in life in everything and what you said also that we need to learn to get better at sharing the planet and the resources that we have you know available because i think we in life we always think oh that thing that's happening is you know far away from me so it doesn't affect me you might not see it now but in 10 years in a couple of years you never or might be tomorrow you're going to feel that and we're all connected whether we like to admit it or whether we don't and what, one thing I never actually got to ask you, I uh, wanted to ask you earlier in the conversation that you've been doing this for so long, where does, where does your passion for this come from, for the, the line of work that you do? Has it always been something you've wanted to do since you were a child? Did, were you inspired by your parents? Well, I'm quite creative as a person, so I liked architecture, I like design, I like places. I like traveling, I like um, exploring different cities. I also like science fiction. Science fiction, yeah. okay, interesting. So I think science fiction is looking at the scenario of the future. So I like to, I like to, to explore the future. Mm. I started by doing uh, archaeology, in fact, when I was a student in architecture. And then at some stage I said, no, <laughs> old stones, well, they are important to, to understand where we come from and what where city is about. Yeah. I'm fascinated by cities, but I think to, to look at science fiction as well is important to look at where we could go if we go wrong. Mm, yeah? True, so, true, true, true. Uh, I like to look at the future and I think it's really important. Uh, but again, to think of uh, the <laughs> balance, you know, to look at, uh, at the past is exactly. also very important. Yeah. I've been to Pompeii, for example, four times in my life. I oh, really... Wow. I'm also um, very interested in in this type of uh, uh, old cities. What were the first cities in the world? And uh, Pompeii has unfortunately collapsed. Also, looking at um, what could be the cause of of um, collapse in the future. So I like collapsology and mm. this kind of um, literature. Yeah, yeah, uh, sure, sure. Although sometimes yeah. it's depressing. Yeah, um, yeah I'm sure. <laughs> But I think science fiction can be also uh, enlightening and for future urban planners. Exactly. Yes. No, uh, and y your your interest in science fiction makes so much sense with the work that you do because I was just thinking about movies, you know, like Back to the Future, like, you know, all these, and we've had these dystopian end of the world movies or what the future could look like with flying cars and so on. So. Uh, it's really cool that you, that's where you look, you know, sometimes that, uh, to get inspiration for, you know, potential opportunities or potential things that we might need to, you know, start looking out for. Um, Christine, I wanted to thank you so much for our conversation today. I just have one last question. This is a question we ask all our guests. So our message with this podcast is to show that success comes in many forms and that learning never stops. Now, and I'm sure throughout your career, you've learned a million things but if I told you I'm like Christine you can only give you have to give someone one piece of advice from all the experience you've learned if there's one piece of advice that you would want to share with a person what would you share with them I would say be yourself okay and keep going be yourself keep going don't compromise 
Don't compromise. Don't compromise, yeah. Okay. And uh, yes, on who you are and where you come from. Couldn't end it in a better way. That was beautiful. Christine, I wanted to say uh, thank you so, so much for coming on the show. Um, this has been such a fun conversation. I've really, really learned so, so much from you. And I think anyone listening to this podcast is going to have a, a big wake up call to think about, you know, not just their place in the world, but where, the world in general and where we're going. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you, Ralet. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for tuning into this episode of the AUD podcast channel. We really hope that you enjoyed it and learned something from it. We have a lot of incredible guests lined up for you on the show, and we're so excited to bring you their inspiring stories. To stay up to date with all the latest episode releases, please make sure to like, share, follow, and subscribe to the podcast on the AUD Instagram page at AUD Dubai.